Hello, good evening, and welcome to the TAT Show. I'm John Drummond, and I'm your host for the next 60 minutes. Um, you'll notice something rather strange in the background. It looks as if I've overnight become some sort of plutocrat with uh, a grand piano uh, and a library and other fairly luxurious items like a sort of built-in fireplace. Uh, th this is entirely illusory and is based upon a photograph which cropped up at the 11th hour when we were trying to find the, the, our conventional background with the studio. And the reason for that was because I was invited to reboot uh, my uh, iMac. Uh, and like a, a good obedient chap, I did so. Uh, the iMac decided for, for, for better and for greatly for worse that it was going to do some sort of uh, upgrades in the background. Uh, of a nature uh, that I'm presently unaware of. Uh, the result was it has uh, reduced uh, my um, capacity, the IT capacity here to almost zero, uh, such that we didn't have the luxury of having the, the usual background uh, that you're accustomed to seeing. Anyway, regardless of all of that, uh, the show goes on. And uh, as you know, this is the TNT show. So it's very much your show. Uh, it's the nation talks and this is your opportunity to ask questions of our guest and as you know we always have great guests I mean, this is our 133rd show or thereabouts and uh, we've had a uh, almost three years continuously of a uh, really really good guests people who make you think people who uh, as we try to do on the show to educate inform and entertain and uh, almost all of our guests have been fully qualified in, in so doing. And tonight is no exception, as you will find out in a couple of seconds. I just wanted to say a quick word though about British democracy and what a great day it's been. Uh, obviously, no doubt many of you have seen uh, Boris Johnson uh, telling the world that he doesn't tell lies, or at least he doesn't tell parliament lies. Uh, <laughs> it's farcical. But on a more serious note, uh, the uh, British government has announced that uh, as part of its um, immigration uh, legislation, it intends to detain 45,000 children. That's its estimate of the number of detainees under the new legislation that will be children, 45,000. To put this in context, the total prison capacity of England and Wales is around about 85,000. And of those 85,000 places, if I call them that, cells, uh, places where people are detained, uh, all of those are spoken for apart from 600. So if your arithmetic is anything like mine, you'll be wondering where the 24,000 odd children are going to be housed. Clearly not in any sort of uh, prison arrangement of any kind of a conventional nature. Uh, no doubt they'll be concentrated somewhere. Let's uh, move on to our, our guest tonight. It's a, a rare uh, privilege uh, to welcome the editor of the Sunday National, Stuart Ward. And uh, Stuart will be talking to us about a range of things. Journalism, obviously, uh, running a major newspaper. How, what, does the, what, what does an editor do? What, what are the pressures, uh, for example? Uh, and at the time we'll be talking about a range of other issues as well, and those will be determined largely by the questions and comments we receive. Uh, so take your opportunity, uh, send us your thoughts, and we'll try and incorporate as many as we possibly can. Now, to our guest tonight, the TNT show welcomes Stuart Ward. Hi Stuart, how are you? I'm not bad, John. Thank you very much for bringing me along to the show. Oh, it's a great pleasure. It's a great pleasure. Uh, Tell us a little bit, because a lot of people will be slightly confused as to what an editor does. I mean, for example, what, what is a typical weekend like for you? Because you've got to, you've got to get the paper out on a Sunday yeah. at the crack of dawn. How do you do that? <laughs> um, yeah, so obviously, you know, um, my kind of primary job title is, is as editor of the Sunday National. Um, but uh, within that, my role also is, is, is kind of managing editor of the National. So there's a there's kind of the kind of the week involves both papers in a lot of different ways. Um, so uh, to sum up my job, it's kind of like I'm the 
kind of like chief firefighter, to be honest, John. That's kind of my like job a, a lot of the time. It's just you know seeing um, checking when we need help and with various issues. But in terms of the Sunday itself and what a typical weekend looks like, um, normally what will happen is um, you, we'll we'll talk during the week about we'll throw around ideas for what maybe in the, the Sunday paper. Um, you know, we'll just think about you know this is a this is a topic that's come up on the Monday. Where might this topic be by Sunday? And I'll chat to a couple of the reporters. Um, however, uh, over the week, it really starts to kind of pick up on Wednesday and Thursday. That's when we have our first kind of big conferences uh, and we start talking about, you know, well, what's going to be in our seven days broadsheet pullout, what's going to be in our um, in the daily paper, what kind of layout we have. Um, so that goes on over kind of Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, same time as that, and working on the daily paper, chipping in here and there. Um, and then it all comes to Saturday, which is obviously the, the kind of the crux of it all. Um, so normally we're never where we want to be on a Saturday morning. I mean, just like everything in life, is, <laughs> you're never you're never quite as far ahead as you want to be. There's always been some tech issues, or you know, as as you know all too well from this one, John, there's always some tech issues or something like that. Um, but come in on Monday morning, sorry, on Saturday morning, and um, and just kind of see the lie of the land, see where we kind of been. Um, what, what's happened in the morning? Have a look at um, the kind of embargo press releases. A lot of the parties um, will put out a press release on a Saturday morning. This embargo till the next day, um, especially Scottish Lib Dems um, and Scottish Labour and Scottish Conservatives, more than probably the SNP traditionally, will send out a kind of press release on a Saturday morning um, with a story for the next day. So you're just looking over and seeing seeing everything that's in the inbox. Um, that's probably I probably get in about. Hmm, 10 or 11 in the morning um, and then it's just you know full steam ahead looking over pages proofreading pages deciding what's going where uh, redrawing them to fit the shape um, so, and that just kind of continues the sub editors usually come in about one o'clock on, on a Saturday so they come in and they start again, joining in the, the proofreading etc and then um, and we try to kind of have everything wrapped up by about well, officially by about 9 30 at night is the, is the official kind of deadline we're aiming for. Yeah. Um, but, you know, sometimes it runs in really than that. <laughs> so it's just, you know, a lot, a lot of proofreading of all, a lot of um, frantic yeah. redrawing of boxes to fit in the latest breaking news. Yeah, so, so that was, you could have everything prepared and all of a sudden the story breaks. Oh, yes. Yeah. Or even worse, nine o'clock. There, there's, you know, we, we were grateful that and the SNP chief executive announced his resignation early on Saturday, um, so rather than nine o'clock at night. But uh, yes, so there's always something. Oh, that's amazing, isn't it? Um, and I mean, Fleet Street, the Fleet Street I remember way back when, because I am much older than you, mm. was, was people who worked under enormous pressure, but they added to the pressure by yes, getting, uh, getting uh -huh. to lunchtime. Uh, and I always thought to myself, how do you manage to get? <laughs> I I couldn't. I mean, it's a fantastic point, John. I mean, I am when I moved into the flat I live in just now. It's a very near the press bar, um, which is which is you know the the, the hub of many a story from people around here. But you know, I mean, it's a serious issue as well because you know I, the Sunday National Editor before me was, was Roxanne Sarushian, and um, you know I think a lot of people have very fond memories of the Sunday Herald, especially obviously its role in the bench referendum, mm. um, before the Sunday Herald kind of. Became the two papers that is now the Sunday National and the Herald on Sunday, and um, you know Richard Walker is a fantastic editor, and I think a lot of people are familiar with Richard Walker. Obviously, he's a national columnist, but you know Rocks as well was um, just integral to the Sunday Herald. I mean, really, absolutely, just so important to it over the years. And and yeah, Rocks has shared a few tales over the years of, of being the kind of last last person standing in the office, having to having to fill in some blanks because others have um, went missing. So. Yeah, so, it's a, it is a good point. You, you, you mentioned the Herald there. Now, mm. people are asking, how does this work? Because the, the Herald takes a different political position to the National, yes. the National. And you share the same area. I mean, it's, you're, you're sort of cheek by jowl. Mm. Yes. So, yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's something that obviously this is a question that we get quite asked quite a lot in terms of, you know, what's your relationship like with the Herald? Mm. Um, and, I mean, in purely practical terms, when we were in our old office in, in, in Renfield Street, we were all kind of packed into a newsroom yeah. uh, and you'd hear yourself shouting over it. So, but, but now the, the new office we have, we're on different floors. So um, 
I'll leave it to your readers and audience to guess who has nice before. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, I mean, there's, 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 in terms of editorial, there's no overlap at all. I mean, there's just none. I, there's a few. I think there's, you know, sometimes um, maybe uh, Leslie Reddick, for example, writes for both. You know, so in, in terms of columnists and stuff. Um, but in terms of editorial, there's just there's no there's there's not really any talking at all. I mean, we maybe if we're in the Hollywood office, we have a you know very limited space of Hollywood reporters might chat to each other, but um, there's no real editorial overlap. Um, there's obviously quite a competitive streak between the two papers. I would suggest yeah. being part of the same group and and, and aiming at very different audiences. And um, there's definitely a competitive streak. Um, there are really areas where like uh, we can kind of work together to. A useful extent but that's more in terms of for example the printing press is obviously the kind of group printing press and stuff like that um so you know it's it's more that kind of area where being part of a bigger news group is a, is a factor and um, but in terms of the editorial there is um there is there's is more of that it's a it's a rivalry i think it's actually you know <laughs> so well that's that's helpful you're on different floors then if you're if you're, <laughs> yeah. if you're competing in that sense i mean it's yeah. different if you all sort of together and you think well it's just what uh, but so uh, I, I, and all of these newspapers, the Herald and the, mm. the National, are all part of the NewsQuest stable of, of yes. newspapers. Uh, does NewsQuest own any other newspapers in the UK? Uh, that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, NewsQuest has has um, masses of titles across the UK. It, it's mm, and recently kind of acquired Action, which is a big kind of publisher down the south. Mm. Um, for the most part. NewsQuest titles are um, local, you know, very local focused. So you know, it's 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 very, you know, in terms of um, Bournemouth Echo, for example, um, is is one of their one of their titles down south. So it's Scotland's in a wee bit of a different situation for NewsQuest in that we have national titles, obviously, you know, with with the National and the Herald primarily. And um, so yeah, a lot of different titles, but we're in a wee bit of a different boat here because we're um, we're uh, yeah we're we're across Scotland. Yeah. Do you ever get together with people from other titles? Yeah, well, it's, it's it's useful in a lot of senses. So we definitely have brainstorming sessions in terms of, well, here's how it, I think maybe, I don't want to spiral too far into a different issue yet, but um, so for us, there's always, I think there's big advantages to being part of a, a bigger group, right? So um, we always kind of see the national as like a, kind of like a, a megaphone for the independence movement in a lot of ways, so that, you know, we are within the kind of structures of the mainstream media. You know, that's that's you know, we have a very professional printing press. We have you know, we have digital teams and all that stuff. Really fantastic advertising team, and that we share across the board. And and in terms of best practice for social media and you know, and the publishing software we use and all that stuff, we have meetings with you know across the group and and kind of you know, um, work together on um how we can like improve the technology and things like that yeah and for example the printing press that we have is you know really fantastic right they do an amazing job i mean it's just given the challenges printing presses are facing now especially with the cost of paper after brexit yeah. just going through the roof and um, and they are kind of facilitated to exist by this network of papers that all use them um, and it means that we can use that for example when we did our one million paper project you know we printed one million papers at a very you know spreading across Scotland, that was facilitated by having that press, which is, you know, a wider group press and um, and making the most of it. So yeah, we, we chat for we chat for for things like that across titles. A lot of the titles I think as well like to stick together because there's a real issue in the regional press with them um, um, in terms of the BBC's dominance. Yeah. Um, especially in England, the, the kind of regional dominance at a local level of the BBC and you know different regions. Um, it makes it hard for a lot of those groups to kind of compete with the BBC for various reasons. So a lot of these groups are in a lot of these little local titles are in the habit of kind of sharing best practices across each other across the group because that's how they can um, compete. And and so we try and take what learning we can from that as well. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, it would seem to me, looking at it from a distance, that it must be quite challenging to sell advertising for the national and the Sunday national mm. because yes. of, because of your political line. Yeah, I mean, it's spot on. <laughs> it's, just, it's always been a, it's always been a massive issue for us versus um, versus other titles in the group. Um, it's seen a, it's seen as a political paper, even though you know certain papers have just went on a trip to Rwanda with 
the Home Secretary and, Ooh. you know, I don't think, and it was a very selective group of papers which went on that trip, but they wouldn't really be seen as political by advertisers in the way that we are. Um, and, you know, we think part of what makes our paper quite, you know, accurate is that we're really open about the fact that we're partial. You know, we're, we're frank that you know, yeah. we are in favour of a more progressive, independent Scotland. Um, yeah. So, you know, we're out there and we're saying that's who we are and that's a lens through which you can read our coverage. Um, so, you know, it, it, that, doesn't, that doesn't phase advertisers. They, they just, they, they still have that hesitance of thinking, oh God, if we go there, everyone's going to think we're this and that. And yeah. The truth is, it's never borne out in reality. Anything an advertiser has come to us, the fact is our readers love spending money in Scotland, for example, they love local products. And um, so it usually goes well for the advertisers when they do come, but that's why we you know traditionally, we're really reliant on readers and subscribers and for support and we're, we're always very grateful for that as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, you, you, you can see the problem with the advertising because it tends to be driven by you know, the, the, uh, the sort of, uh, the social mores that, that mm. tend to be predominant in a society. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, the reality is that if independence were to happen, then you would probably find you couldn't be able to cope with the amount of advertising. <laughs> it would then make so much sense yeah. for people to say, you know, you really need to find out more about our baked beans in Scotland. Yeah, and it, if anyone's it. ever watched Ireland, Irish television, for example, mm -hmm. or Irish newspapers, I mean, they're just cram full of the same stuff that you get in Scotland, except it's badged Ireland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the and the producers are more than happy to to to, to promote that. And, and that's again a point we try to illustrate as well. I mean, because I know a lot of the time where, you know, people, what people's perception of the nationalists a lot of the time is the kind of pro-independence front pages that get shared on social media. You know, that's the, that's the perception. That's what people um, see. Um, but there's a wider kind of ethos that runs through the national and it's a kind of devil's in the detail situation for us where, I'm just going to use one example. So on the back page of Seven, Seven Days, which is our broadsheet pillar on a Sunday, um, we have a, a regular travel piece by Robin McKelvey. And Robin is just, you know, he's nominated for an award, just now travel writing award. He's a fantastic travel writer, but he's got a really just key knowledge of Scottish history as well. And he's able to bring in um, these references from other countries, talking about how Scotland has influenced them. And his travel piece, he's reviewing, you know, where's the best place to stay, but bringing in these historical um, historical references, etc., and showing that Scotland has its place in the world and that Scotland has made a stamp in the world. And it's, you know, it's a really positive vision of Scotland and it's, it's not saying this is, you know, we're pro-independence because of this travel piece, but it's saying that, you know, Scotland is a really, you know, is a country that has a lot of strength and has made a mark in the world and, and, and yeah. that people know and care about. And again, this is the kind of thing that we think, well, why wouldn't advertisers want to be associated with that? You know, that positive vision of Scotland. Um, but yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> and, and very often it's a question of floodgates. You mm. know, once somebody decides that, hey, this is good for my business. Everyone else tends to tumble in after them because it's the old old story. If you if you let somebody dominate uh, a particular advertising outlet uh, to your detriment, I mean your shareholders get terribly upset and say, "Come on, guys, you know we're losing money here. Let's get something done about this." <laughs> yep. but, uh, but it's the nature of the beast. The people are are, are apprehensive. Uh, I expect uh, until things change, and then all of a sudden everything changes, and you're. Mm -hmm. A different, a completely different environment. Uh, what are they, you know, in terms of editorial decisions, are you free to take the editorial decisions that, that you think are appropriate? Or is, do you find from time to time you get lent on by somebody who says, oh, that's a bit radical, a bit, a bit too tasty? Uh, no, I, no, I mean, in terms, especially in terms of group, um, in terms of, you know, um, you know news quest wide, I mean, there, there has not just I've been here for since in some shape or form for about five years, and there has never been one single instance where they've said that's a bit of independence there. And we've done some, you know, we've done some fairly out there front pages and some fairly out there statements. We've been obviously we're rel relatively um, a Republican paper in terms of the monarchy, um, and uh, and you know, never ever ever has it been any case of um, anyone saying, "Can you mean that in a wee bit?" Um, total freedom. And in terms of the editorial decision making on the Sunday and stuff like that, you know, I chat with, with Laura Webster, who edits National on, on a kind of daily basis, um, and, and, and all the website stuff. And, um, um, you know, Callum Bear is still editor in chief, and people know Callum when he was editor in the National as well. So, 
you know, I chat to them about that, but there's never there's never any kind of undue influence. It's, it's something that we're, we're very fortunate. The influences I think you have are more, um, you know, structural, I think, in terms of the press. You know, that's much more of a factor for us to contend with, our structural issues with journalism. So just, again, just for example, um, uh, you know, uh, the way that a lot of people often talk about, oh, we'd love more coverage of um, this kind of local issue. This issue is really specific to our region. And I mean, I'm from Newton Stewart, I'm from down the southwest of Scotland and the Friesen Galloway, and I'm, I'm quite used to the central belt bias and, and wanting to tackle it. But the way that journalism is structured, there is a central belt bias because your reporters aren't based down there and they don't know what's happening on a daily basis. Um, so overcoming that and, and you know, getting networks where people are feeding stories into us, that's more of a challenge for us in terms of making sure our editorial is broad than, um, than any kind of pressure from, from above, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I take it on NewsQuest, want to be assured of is that there is a revenue stream which has been agreed exactly. in advance uh, and that is being sustained. Exactly. Uh, That's 100%. So, to that extent, it's a bit like a football team. You, you're actually the captain of the team. Uh, <laughs> the, last, the last thing the manager wants to do is to come onto the field. <laughs> exactly. And, and you know what? And, and we're so fortunate because for us, it's a case where um, our commercial and kind of personal goals are aligned. The fact is that if we did not authentically support the independence movement, you know, if we weren't trying to support yes groups with, you know, doing special supplements for them or free papers or um, reporting the coverage, if, if we weren't trying to present a post Scotland vision, um, then, you know, we would lose subscribers. People wouldn't subscribe to us. Yeah. So it's, it's very much a case of where we, we, don't, we don't have to think, oh God, we need to do this because it's going to make us more money. We know that people will support us if, if we're doing what I think people want us to do. Um, and the challenge for us always is, is getting that message across and, and saying to people, you know, look beyond the kind of national front and social media, you know, look beyond the just the, the, the article that happens to go viral and, and really kind of um, engage with us and, and come to us and see if there's anything we can do for your groups and things like that. Um, yeah. And that's, yeah, that, that's the challenge for us. Is there anything you've ever run that you've thought, I didn't expect that to be controversial? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I said, oh God, there definitely is. <laughs> I'm just trying to think what it might be. Um, well, while you're thinking about it, let me give you an example. Mm. Um, I used to know the editor of the, I lived in Largs, the Largs mm -hmm. in Weekly News, and I once asked him that question. And he said, yeah, yeah, I, the most stick I ever got. And he said, it was colossal. He said, people stopped me in the street and, and denounced me for the mistake I'd made, which wasn't a mistake. He said, somebody was out, a woman was cleaning her windows and she fell off the ladder and the poor soul would got a, a twisted ankle. Uh, however, mm -hmm. uh, being a doughty housewife, she managed to crawl around the corner. She was collected by an ambulance in, in the street, the adjoining street. And he mm -hmm. reported that, that she was collected by the ambulance in the street. And the whole town knew that she lived otherwhere, otherwise. And they said, how can you get that wrong? I mean, you know, that's not where she lives at all. She lives in the street next door. And, and nobody would even give him the good grace to say, look, this is what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and said, that's it. That. Months afterwards, people would say, I remember you. You thought that Jenny lived in such a <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God, that rings a bell from the local papers as well. But no, it's, it's um, yeah, there's, there's, I think with that stuff, it's usually little things that we've, we've worked the headline in a way that people, you know, it was misinterpreted that we didn't want to be interpreted that way. And um, my personal worst error, which is misinterpreting thing, which is my error, was that I once put an um, astrologer in a headline rather than astronomer. That that was possibly the most complaints we've ever gotten for any article. And um, was was that the, the, there is an example of I guess of that, but it was it was actually from a time in the Glasgow Times. And um, during COVID, I was I was just on the Glasgow Times for a little bit, and um, which is obviously our kind of sister title. And mm. um, and the Glasgow Evening Times, and um, I had to do the front page for it, and I thought, we always have Rangers and Celtic at the top, because it's Glasgow Times, and, um, you know, it was, someone had appointed a new assistant manager, and some player had done something, so did a little cutouts of the two people and put them at the top of the, top of the page, and then we got a complaint the next day, and it was, um, one of them had a face mask, and one of them didn't. And the reason was just because there were only two pictures we had of it from the day, I mean, it was just, yeah. one of the guys was a nobody, and we got a complaint saying, well, you know, I, why is your paper saying that one of them is responsible and wearing a face mask and the other one's irresponsible and, you know, 
my team are looking for like that. So there's yeah, there's there's some that you just have to let wash over you uh, in terms of their validity. Now here's a slightly testy question. Uh, the, the I mean the future of all newspapers is in some mm. uh, Yes. The cost of newsprint, uh, you know, people are trying to economize everywhere. There's nothing particularly Scottish about this question. It's mm. just a, a general question. People are getting their news from a whole range of places nowadays. Uh, I mean, having a digital presence at one time was sort of nice. Yeah. Now it's absolutely essential. It's yeah. not nice. So, so what's your sense of the future of the Sunday National and the National? Yeah, so, um, I, I mean, your spot on it has changed so much in the last five years, even. I mean, even, you know, just it's such a different world. Um, and it is very, it, there is a digital first focus. You know, it is, you know, that's that's the approach. That's what you're thinking. You know, that's where the reach is. And we were very fortunate that before coronavirus, not fortunate, it was smart planning by Calm Beard, um, said that digital subscriptions are going to be really important. Yeah. Um, and we went out there and we said to the independence movement, look, you know, if you support us, We'll take these steps for every thousand subscribers we get and people really backed us and they meant we were able to launch our fact checking service and things like that so we went into the kind of coronavirus pandemic with that net of digital subscribers um and it's very fortunate did because the the coronavirus pandemic was just just yeah total nightmare for newspapers i mean just you know um that it, you know it wasn't a case of once the pandemic lifted the same amount of people are going out and buying your paper it's just you know it's, it's not the same um, so, you know, it's, it's a totally different ballgame from where it was. And um, and that is still our, you know, so at that point, then we've got to start thinking, you know, as you say, like, what is, what's the Sunday National for? And what's the, what's the National for as a paper product? Um, and, you know, we're still really proud of it. And a lot of us, including myself, kind of like newspapers because it's a really good way to put, um, put stories into their full context. So just for example, you know, with a lot of leadership contest stuff. Um, if uh, you're just reading one story online, maybe it's hard, it, it wouldn't be, it look so balanced, it wouldn't look so fair. Mm. Where if I'm setting it in a newspaper, you can have it, right, well, they're going there, and they're going there, and they're going just underneath it, and you're, and you're yeah. taking people through the full picture. So there's a lot of value for it. We still think there's a lot of value for it. But it, we have to be realistic about you know where the industry is, like you say, and, and again, where, where paper costs are, and they're just, just astronomical. Um, and that's where we try to kind of look for opportunities to maximize what we're doing. So just, you know, last um, year when there was a kind of manifest uh, at my goal screen about, you know, they were by the statue of the money and um, talking about the kind of key issues uh, for the Highlands and Islands. And, you know, the fantastic team there and Leslie Reddick came on board and we did a kind of 16 page special supplement. And it was looking at, you know, it was a really kind of, not party political, it was a very broad look at the issues and possible mm. futures and the things like that. And that was a case where we could say, right, we've got this big event coming up. We're going to use our paper as a as a tool here. We are able to put together a 16 page package that they can take out and hand to people. Because printing costs are a lot, but we can, you know, we can get it at reasonable rates because it's our printing press. So we can take this 16 page product and make that useful for yes group. I mean, things like that. So we're looking, we're always looking now for opportunities to just maximize rather than just, you know, every day putting out a 60 page paper or whatever, you wouldn't be 60 pages, yeah. but, um, you know, looking for times that we can seize in the moment um, and, 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 and capitalizing that and helping people in that sense. And I think the other, the other kind of future, I think, for the Sunday as well is it's still, um, it is still a really useful tool for, platforming people because people still feel like it's got a prestige you know newspapers will always have that feeling of there's a prestige to them um so you know somebody maybe that there, there are people who wouldn't necessarily write for just a digital organization but they'll write for the prestige of seeing their name on a newsstand um and you can attract them that way so it's, I think it's useful as well for, for how you platform people and the big one for us has always been it's on newsstands yeah um it's on newsstands, a big message, the only one that is pro-independence, and in a lot of cases, the only one that kind of takes a kind of generally pro-Scotland stance, and in a lot of cases, might even be the only one in newsstands that's um, calling out, for example, the kind of home office stats you're talking about at the start of the show. Um, and we want that to be in a newsstand, so even if people aren't picking up the newspaper, um, 
because we still have the support of digital subscriptions and stuff like that, we're able to still put a lot of papers into shops. And it's there whenever someone walks into their Sainsbury's, you can't miss it. The National's there with that big message in bold. Um, and especially over recent years, I mean, we've, we've moved away from kind of graphic ones a little bit more towards um, kind of wordy ones. Uh, and there's a place for both, but we, we do we do like the value of the word ones because again, it's just something that you can just get a message across and you know in six or seven big words on a newsstand. Um, if you I just as well as that, I mean, we try to use our use our titles on the Sundays, especially kind of more Scottish travel and Scottish arts and culture and um, and, and environmental issues as well. And um, mm -hmm. the Sunday National, especially because of the bigger space we've got, it's really fantastic for doing that. And I mean that. I, I don't, I think if it's another one of those ones where it doesn't get much recognition because it's not going to go viral on social media or it's not going to go viral on Twitter. But if you look at that paper compared to other ones on the Sunday and, and look at the kind of coverage of the Scottish Arts and Culture, we're really proud, really proud of the coverage we have. I, I think you should be proud. It's burning your blushes. I think you, I think you should be proud. <laughs> I, I, and I'm not saying that simply because you mm -hmm. know, I have a column with, uh, with Elliot. It, it's the, it, I think people want something a bit meatier on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, the, 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 you know, uh, for me, the, the, the news comment that that balance changes a little bit on, at weekends. Because mm -hmm. people have time. Mm -hmm. They have time. Yes. They, have, they, have, they can actually sit down there and say, look, I've got an hour and I can. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to know the background to some of this stuff. But I've got the foreground stuff. And I've got the yes, that's, that's 100%. Stuff. It. Yeah. And, and, and that's that's the thinking. It's, that, that's the thinking where it's you know the same before when we think in the Monday we look at the Monday and the Tuesday we look at the stories that are happening and we say right by the end of the week you know what's the context people will need how how are we going to move this on and, and is there you know yeah and what what is the background for me to that to those stories so it's exactly what you're saying and then you know as well as that this is this is part of why when when Rocks and Richard kind of relaunched the Sunday National um, and you know I had a front row seat to the last days of the Sunday Herald because I used to work the National Saturday Digital Shift. And I'd be in the office sitting with the sports desk watching the, the Sunday Herald be produced. Um, but when they when they came in and and launched the Sunday National, um, they said, right, we're bringing back seven days, which is our big broadsheet pullout. Because like you're saying, John, it's that idea of you're sitting down on a Sunday and you've got a bit more time and you know you've got a chance to slow down. There's the big read. There's the big front page cover story, and, and, and you know give people a chance to digest digest that. Yeah. And it, it's fairly typical of what happens right across the world. I mean, if you're in the States, for example, you can scarcely lift the Sunday mm. newspaper. And that's just one mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. By two, <laughs> somebody else to help you home with it. You know, because there's so many sections. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. New York, for example. Just, but even I used to live in uh, Minnesota. Even there, yep. the newspaper was way, way bigger than Sunday. You know, but then again, it had. Four sections of advertising, you know, clips yes. and stuff like that. Definitely makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. you know, which justified the spend. I mean, you can yep. really cover lots of spend when you're you're shifting ads like that. Yep. Uh, but but there was a symbiotic relationship. People who bought the paper actually some of them bought it for the for the clipper ads. You know, it's just oh yeah yeah. You get things, all that yeah, stuff absolutely. going together. Mm -hmm. You've got a lot. It's a powerful combination. But but you you mentioned digital, and obviously you know, there's a lot of uh, discussion about how digital things are going to have to get in the future because you can do a lot of it with a digital platform very economically compared to trying to do a lot with a print newspaper. Print newspaper mm -hmm. is always expensive. Yep. There's a whole raft of things you can do, you know, like polling and you can do <coughs> all sorts of other stuff. You can, you can make it interactive in a way that it wouldn't be possible, perhaps, uh, with, with obviously with a print newspaper. And uh, I just wondered if you had any chance to look at some of the projections and the, and the, the sort of um, suggestions for the way uh, and the degree to which the digital newspapers uh, will be part of that, a bigger part of the mix in future. Hmm. I think there's still a lot of work to find the model. I think we're still a bit off it. Uh, it's general in terms of just you know the focus. The fact is that the newspaper is still just spending money. You know, they, that's that's where we're at. And um, and so you know, the, there's not going to be an overnight shift in terms of just scrapping scrapping that. But with the projections, I know we're, we're we're I think on our level and certain level of, of my 
you know, as editor of Sunday National, I'm, I'm really just so focused on the day to day mm. that there is wider strategy, but it's not it's not looking into you know, um, are we going to have a digital paper in four years? Or whatever. No, I wouldn't say that. I think for us, it's a lot of the focus is just on thinking about well, if we are focusing more on digital, what's our purpose? You know, what's we know we've got quite a defined idea of what the Sunday National is as a paper and what the National is as a paper. Um, so what's the kind of purpose of our digital exercise? Um, and you know, something we got told for a lot of years was, um, or a lot of people suggested, was you, know, you definitely appeal to independence movement, but what about broader? What about yeah. beyond the independence And you know what, this is where having that digital focus. Um, and this is a, kind of a, a positive aspect of the projection, I suppose, is that you've got a huge net, a huge audience, a huge you know, potential audience out there. We've, we have stories kind of um, going viral you know, all the time about whether it's TikTok or whether it's you know, Facebook or Instagram or, or just the website itself. And it's stuff that, you know, uh, just as an example, obviously when Scotland was kind of leading the way with the um, period project legislation. And, and we were kind of putting a lot of kind of videos and stuff out on social media about that and it's getting shared and across the world and, and across Scotland. So, you know, you've got that audience that's there and you're showing Scotland in a kind of, you know, again, a positive light and then and showing that Scotland's place in the world. But yeah, the, the the question is how we keep turning those people into. Um, well, we, there's, an, there's an extent we just we're happy with people reading it and feeling a bit better in Scotland. You know, we're happy with that. That's that's a win for us because we're trying to. You know, we're obviously a point in newspaper. I mean, if we make the case that well, here's what we could do as an independent country that we can just now, and someone reads that and goes, oh, yeah, good point, and that's a win. And maybe it's someone who's clicked on an article about you know. Maybe it's someone who's clicked in a review of a new season succession and then it's on the sidebar a little story about Scott Wind and has clicked into that and went into that. But then the other element of course is that we need people's support, and that's where um, you know, that's where we have to think about how we can how can we bring people into support us and bring in subscribers to, to enable what we do. And you know, this is where we want to just make sure we're out here with, you know, on shows like this or on the S group say, well, here's what we're doing and here's what we want you to kind of back us and support us so we can do more of this, so we can, you know. Um, so we can be out with you more on the kind of, with rallies, or so we can be more present in a reporting of the arts or whatever it may be. Um, so yeah, it's, there's still a lot of questions about how we how we do it, but that's that's where the that's where the field is. Yeah, you know. I mean, I, I could see how Sunday Sunday newspapers that would be even more uh, impacted um, whether to be an independent state. Mm. Uh, because then there would be a whole raft and range of issues that would need in-depth reporting that couldn't yeah. be done with a soundbite. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it always seemed to me you've got a great advantage in, in BBC Scotland because they've gone tabloid. Mm -hmm. Maybe Sunday National has gone in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I just wonder how much of your Sunday audiences a bunch of people who are not terribly fussed about independence, but just want to know the background. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I, this is the kind of, kind of, I think, plays into this question, you know, of, of our purposes and and um, and the challenges we have. So um, there is a, there is a kind of culture around a lot of news just now, which is hyper paced. You know, it's just I don't even need to read the article. I've seen the headline. I, I kind of I do some um, some teaching on one of the journalism courses in Glasgow as well, and um, and a thing I like to say is that clickbait is good. And, and what I mean by that is that it's not good to have a headline that's a total lie and get people through the you know, top 10 things or whatever. That's not good clickbait. What I mean by that is you've got to, in this kind of modern journalism, you have to structure your story online in a way that will get people to read the full piece. It's just a realistic challenge. Because if you don't, if you have a headline that gives away the whole game, we've seen it in our stats. It doesn't matter how good the piece is, people won't read it because they think they've got the whole story from the headline. And there's a lot of fantastic people and a lot of fantastic, um, you know, readers who will miss out on a really good story because they just, they haven't realized that, oh God, that's actually a really, really engaging piece. So, you know, as these challenges are in the modern kind of version of digital journalism are, you know, how can you bring people into these stories that they don't maybe think they want to read, but actually if they did, if they did read that piece, if they did read this kind of deep, I mean, I, when I started doing this job and, I'm, I'm not flattering you for the sake of John here, but it's a good example, right? See, when I started reading about the, the idea of a Scottish constitution, that is not something I might have clicked on as a headline anyway, if I'd just been seeing it on Twitter. 
But because I, I was reading it, I was like, well, oh, wow, this, is, this makes a lot of sense. This is how we could guarantee the rights of, you know, people, the security of a, of a media, the independence of media. And it's really worthwhile reading. So that's constantly where we are now thinking as well as how can we structure our stories that are not clickbait and that they're just pulling you through to a nonsense article, but that are engaging, that make people read your stories, read your items and become more educated and on the issues because there are, there are so many issues that are complicated and deserve you know real attention real focus yeah i, I mean i i tend to write a bit about morality and constitutions and stuff one mm. of the reasons for that is because it it, it it's a, a way to address the infantilization that's taken place in scotland yeah wherever you get a, a sort of what i would call a sub-state a, 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 a a country that isn't quite an independent state but has some of the uh, accoutrements of an independent state, i.e. Mm. A, a parliament uh, which isn't sovereign but has authority, has some powers, they may be limited. Uh, you, 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 the, 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 the tendency is, is always to take an issue and, and try and reduce it to a tabloid. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's a great temptation because you know that somebody in London is going to tackle the big issue uh, yeah. and therefore you don't have to worry the pretty little heads of your readership about the substantial. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. always seems to me that that's a sort of vicious circle, if you know. Yes, exactly. I mean, you, you, because you, you tend to say, well, oh, the people aren't interested. And in fact, they're probably desperately interested. It's just, I mean, for example, I used to read the Sunday Times and I always found it interesting, but when it came to Scottish issues, it was woeful. Mm -hmm. It was written by people who just didn't understand and frankly didn't care to understand. Uh, and, and what that did over time was, if I think frankly, they created a market for the Sunday National mm -hmm. because you had that yeah. really audience there. We often say we, in a lot of senses we're left an open goal on a lot of issues, yeah. <laughs> which is very nice about them to give us that open goal. Yeah. Um, we try and, see I, I, and I guess your challenge, you know, will be how to extend and develop that in the teeth of the incursions from digital media. I mean, particularly when now we've got this cycle, this 24 hour cycle, where people expect news to be delivered to them just like that. Yep. And they expect to be able to comment on the news. I mean, that, I think that's the other factor. Mm -hmm. And 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 you know, this is. I mean, the also the information overload is definitely is a challenge for a lot of people. I mean, that's that's part of some of the reporting we do is around tackling information overload. So you know, traditionally maybe we'd have done just a really thorough eight hundred word wrap on first minister's questions. Yeah. And um, for example. But now we're trying to think of, right, people are dealing with so much information, they've got so many pressures in their day-to-day -day lives. Is there a way we can make that a bit more accessible? So can we can we take a key issue and just do, you know, 300 words in it that gives you the detail that you need, yeah. but really focuses in on it in a way that, you know, is, a, is engaging and will lead people want to do more reading, but is, is trying to tackle this information overload. So, you know, even whether it's, you know, highlighting a few key points, um, from something and then using that as a way to lead people into more because the in information overload, keeping up to date with everything outside of a Sunday is difficult and that's why again the Sunday is so useful because you're assuming the reader has that time to sit, sit down and you know, <coughs> you know well, just really I mean, yeah. I mean you're a journalist so you know it's part of your whole ethos to mm. you, you, you pride yourself on knowing what your readers want mm. And sometimes you need market research, if only to confirm your thoughts, uh, or, or maybe not, as the case may be, depending on. Do you, do you do a bunch of market research about readership and and its its wishes and tendencies? And we um intermittently, yeah, we do we do surveys and, and polls, and you know, look at. I just. You know, for example, kind of in terms of population versus subscribers, you know, where we can do invest, I think this is Western Isles, um, was a really good place for just for example. So we can look at it in that broad level and we ask people like what would you like more of and, and what would you, you know, what would you like to see. So we do we don't do a lot of it, and we do some of it. And and, and then again, we, we always try and encourage people to 
to chat to us and, and engage with us and, and feedback is extremely useful via letters, etc. Yeah. And um, we're, we're, we're thinking about as well going forward, maybe even the end of this month, launching something that will help people maybe have a more direct line to the newsroom. Because again, we want to be useful to people and we want to know what they want information about because it is hard to be you know, an expert on everything. So if we can be like, if someone's like, right, we really need more information on this issue, then we can yeah. use our network to say, well, that person would be fantastic to write about it. Let's get them involved and, and give that. So, yeah. yeah. If, if you were to, uh, because we're at the 45 minute point now, so mm. now's the appropriate time to sort of get out the sort of um, uh, crystal ball and try and mm. do the pike a little bit. If, if you were to look, say, two years hence, and uh, you were describing Scotland to somebody uh, from outside, what would you think you would be saying to them right now? Do you have the optimistic or the pessimistic answer? <laughs> well, just, just go with the flow. Just yeah. um, off the top. I mean, I'd, I'd like to think in two years, I'd like, to see, I'd like to be able to say to someone, you know, you've seen over these past two years how outward looking Scotland is. You've seen how much we want to have our place in the world. Um, standing with kind of allies who, who care about human rights, who kind of care about um, people in need, the people who need our support. Uh, and you've seen how, you know, we're willing to uh, stand up to Westminster where required and show our support for people across the world who are fighting for the right things. And I, I would say I'd like our paper to be alongside them in that, but I, I think that would be my thing. I, I really like, I really think, and let's say, I think over the next two years, we're really going to be able to, to hammer home Scotland's kind of place in the world, even more than we have just now. Because I think that, I think the kind of uh, egregious offences could have done against this country and, and, you know, what we stand for is, is only going to deteriorate further. I think that's fair. I mean, it's you know, it's 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 the nature of uh, I don't know. I, I I quoted a guy called Professor Danny Dorling in my column uh, a few mm. weeks ago, and and Danny's written a whole bunch of books. He's a left wing economist uh, and uh, or a geographer to be precise. He's mm. going to be coming out soon, and I'll no doubt mention that. But the fact of the matter is, his view is that a lot the Brexit and a lot of the stuff that's happened. Is a direct result of a bunch of people feeling that they were robbed of an empire. Mm, and this yeah. is their way of somehow saying, "Look, uh, this was taken away from me. It was wrong. Mm -hmm. It was done so, and somehow I need to try and recover it." So when yeah. somebody comes along who's a populist and says things like, "Well, you know, somebody, it wasn't your fault." Mm -hmm. Uh, and you're absolutely right. What you were taught at school is absolutely spot on. You did control half the world, or maybe mm. more. You know, the sun never set on the British Empire, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that was taken away from you. You didn't give it up. These yeah. these countries that went independent didn't really want to be independent. What happened was there was a bunch of idiots in Westminster and the Foreign Office <laughs> gave away uh -huh. the empire. Mm -hmm. This is your chance to strike back against these nasty foreigners um, on the European mainland, and and let's take it. And as he pointed out, the the the, the bulk of the people who voted, the great mass of people, I suppose percentages, we, we talk about the red wall. But the fact of the matter is that the uh, Brexit was secured by votes of people in the southeast. Mm -hmm. And just to tie this into the paper as well, John, you know. In, in terms of our ethos, I mean, there's there's always a lot of, I mean, there's, there's a phrase I think often gets thrown in, in in the media, which is about Overton's window, which is this idea of, you know, things that are within the sphere of kind of legitimate debate and things like that. But um, and there's another kind of model of a kind of theory of journalism that's um, called it's kind of Hallen's spheres. And, and I don't want to get too bored in the academic here, but I think, I think it's, you're talking about, you know, Taking these issues seriously, and, and, and the kind of model that Alan kind of talks about at this hierarchy of spheres, where you have kind of you can categorize kind of all journalism into all issues into kind of three different spheres. So there's a sphere of um, consensus, there's a sphere of legitimate debate, and there's a sphere of deviance. So it's these ideas, there's three spheres where you can categorize everything into. So, for example, the sphere of deviance is stuff that journalists don't even feel they need to give any kind of 
thought it's so boring. It's so obviously, it's so obvious that crime is bad, or it's so obvious that you know murder is wrong. So it doesn't get any any kind of play. The sphere of legitimate kind of consensus, the other side of the sphere of consensus, is stuff that's like a given. So in a lot of the media, that would be that the monarchy is a good thing. The monarchy is a, some net benefit, or that you know the British Empire was a positive thing for the world. Yeah. And then there's a middle sphere, which is that sphere of legitimate debate, which is where newspapers feel like they have to give both sides of a story, or you know. And I think it's a really useful model for analysing the media because you can say, right, let's take an issue like the empire, and let's look at where that paper, which of those spheres, they place that issue in. So if you're looking at maybe something like the Telegraph, for example. Um, they would say the empire being a good thing would probably be the sphere of consensus. It's not even up for debate. We don't even need to, you know, we don't need to balance that comment. It's always the empire was a good thing. Whereas on the Sunday National and the National, that's where we feel we stand out a bit because we try to bring these things into that sphere of, of debate and say, right, well, is that is that is that true? Is that what it was? Is it really the case that, um, you know, is it really the case that? The, the monarchy is unquestionably a good thing for the for the country, etc. So we, we, you know, I, I, I find a really useful model, especially in the kind of when all these issues are flying around, to to see where we are placed and to think, is that something that we think is worthy of debate in, in the empire and the damage it's done in that mindset of Empire 2.0 is something that we want to challenge in our paper and we want to give people space to challenge. Yeah. Well, Danny Donling is a guy to talk to because he. <laughs> <laughs> And he's, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a heads up with his new book. Is, is mm, exactly. Uh, yeah, that's right. and that, that'll be interesting. We've had a bunch of comments and questions. Uh, people saying the lack of a balanced media hinders the independence movement. What can be done, if anything, to maximise the indie message? I, you know, I, I'm putting the question to you, but I'm thinking as I do so, I, I'm not sure that it's your job to do that. I mean, it seems to me that if we've got, a, if we've got a, an independence party or parties, <coughs> Maybe that's their job. Mm. Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely, there's, there's a political. I mean, what we what we'd say to that is, um, it is kind of just a truly bizarre scenario where there is one kind of deal in, in Sunday newspaper that supports independence. I mean, what's saying it is just yeah. a, a truly bizarre scenario that would be worthy of its own sixty minutes in TNT. You know, it was just, it really would be. But in terms of what people can can do, I mean, again, I, I stress that we, we try to see the national as a bit of a, a megaphone where we can look at these issues that you think are being not addressed by other parts of the media. In the case of recently, um, the most recent special edition we did was, I think someone mentioned in the comments as well, the Macron Report special. So publishing the Macron Report full and, and also on top of that this year, Laura had the idea of looking into renewables as well and, and opening debate in the future. So, um, you know, exactly, yeah, that comment, yeah, thank you. It's, it's that idea of tell us that things that you think aren't being um, given the space they should get elsewhere, have elsewhere, and then we can look into them and we can see, you know, how we can open that debate. Because when these debates are had, um, I think, you know, when, when you start to look at these, these questions about, for example, you know, the, the, the impact of empire, it, it doesn't look good for it, and it just needs a debate. It needs a light of debate. Show. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, I think I'm, I'm thinking particularly about people of my age who, who, mm -hmm. who are fed a line. Uh, and I see it in the polling. I mean, I, when, I, when I look at uh, the way people over 60 respond to questions about empire, uh, it's very, very different to people sort of uh, under 30. It's it, 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 to a crazy extent. But the most damning thing I ever saw was when a, a British audience and a German audience were shown World War II aircraft. The, the British could immediately identify the Spitfire and the Hurricane. And mm -hmm. nobody in the German audience knew what a Messerschmitt was. Mm -hmm. That's just a wolf. And and you think that they moved on. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and they, they so, said that was yeah. then. This is now. Uh, you know, uh, uh, but somehow in Britain nobody moved on. No, so exactly. That's not what I mean, so. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, no. I just say and, and just get in touch with like. We're, we're, I mean, I think what we really, really want people to feel is that. They can talk to us about issues and they can get in touch with us. We don't want people to just think, you know, we're not just isolated away in top of news quest towers or whatever that we have. We want to engage with people, we want to be out there chatting to people. Um, How do they do that? Like, I mean, for example, if there's somebody watching tonight and they've got this hmm. running issue that they feel hasn't been addressed, yeah. uh, 
and they don't feel the independence parties are doing it, do they write to you? What do they do, Stuart? Yeah, a lot of people have taken that option, and I think it's, it's always a safe bet just to, you know, our emails are just your first name dot last name at the national dot scot. But as well, I'd suggest, you know, our letters inbox, which is letters at the national dot scot, you know, okay. our community editor, Shona Craven monitors them and, and deals with them. And she's always the first person to say, right, we've had a lot of letters with people asking about clarity in this issue. You know, can we have, can we look into it a bit? So letters, our letters inbox as well is a really good general purpose kind of option. Um, because you know it's it's I, I think it's really important for us to be out there showing people that showing people that you know um that that we're kind of we're really interested in being the space for debating these issues and having that debate that isn't maybe allowed elsewhere or doesn't happen elsewhere in the printed press uh, and you know as a as a mainstream platform with the kind of all the all the kind of facilities that a mainstream platform has and um obviously as well and subscribe the national that's helpful too <laughs> but there you go well that's that's great that's super uh, we've only got a couple of three minutes to go uh, are there any last thoughts that you would like to leave with the audience that perhaps we haven't covered up until now um yeah i think i just think it's you know this is a really kind of it's a really interesting time for journalism it's a really because it's it is, you know a kind of you know, I started working at the Gallery Gazette when I was still in high school. So, and then I see that there was very little digital focus. They just got given mobile phones and told you need to film video a week. Um, and now, you know, nine years later, something that's like, it's just giving you take these videos. So it's a really interesting time for journalism, but I, I have the opinion that sometimes we can be a bit too sensitive to criticism, a bit too sensitive to feedback. And um, political journalism, especially, I think we're in a position where we need to win back people's trust. Um, and that's where I, I just I want to come, whether it's coming in shows like your John or just you know out at road shows and things. Just getting these discussions going, um, because that's where digital journalism you kind of have to be useful to people in a new way. They're they're not just going to journalism just to get the basics of the facts and information. They kind of it's almost like back to the original idea of where of the, the French coffee house, which is where all this public sphere stuff started. Of they're coming into the space for debate and for you know. An exchange of ideas. It's not just a one-way thing anymore with journalism. It's this exchange of ideas. This is this. Um, so just really encouraging people to get involved wherever they can, uh, and 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 help shape this paper, which is you know because we want to reflect reflect Scotland and reflect its people. Um, and you know we've obviously got this leadership contest on just now, and um, very soon Scotland's going to have a new first minister, and it's going to be a, a really kind of massive few years for 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 the country. So. We want to be in a place where you know where um, we feel that we're getting that accurately covering and reflecting real Scotland, and where people can think, you know, if I'm reading the National, if I'm reading the Sunday National, if I'm picking up on the Sunday, they're they're going to get a, a paper that's really open to having these debates and having these platforms to discuss the, the big ideas for Scotland, and and I think that can only be a good thing for the, the wider cause of of um, getting yeah. away from the kind of keenest actions. You, I mean, if it if, if it were Westminster, then you know, the, the, the new Prime Minister would have a honeymoon period. Mm. Is that happening in Scotland? <laughs> I think it's going to be quite, I mean, I, I've, um, I think the the chaos that's going to happen, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, all over the leadership race and all that stuff, it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's there's there's so much change happening. You know, it's, it's going to be a huge change, especially with the kind of chief executive of the SNP, which is obviously part yeah. of the government. Um, yeah, it's going to be. There's going to be a lot of um, a lot of navigating to be done. It's going to be interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, this this has been educational, entertaining, and uh, enlightening. Thanks very much uh, for joining us tonight, Stuart. Oh, thank uh, you. I mean, joining. It's, it's great to just have that platform to kind of talk about these issues at a more length. And then thanks as well to everyone who's yeah, watching well, along, commenting along. Perhaps you can come back once the First Minister has been decided oh, exactly. on it. We can, we can talk to you more. <laughs> I'll take some questions on our coverage, exactly. <laughs> if you can stick around for a few minutes after we go off air, that would be that would be helpful. Yes, of course. Uh, well, we're just about through, folks. Uh, I just want to say a few concluding remarks. Uh, normally, I, ha I have a script of sorts, but because of the technology tonight, uh, that has gone into the digital wilderness. Uh, suffice to say that uh, thank you for your questions and comments uh, and thanks Rebecca for saying it was a great show 
uh, and thanks to others who have also liked it. You're very welcome. Uh, we we try to put on a good show for you. Uh, uh, but as you can probably gather from tonight, there's a lot of what you can do. I mean, you 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 can be in touch with the National or Sunday National uh, through the letters or uh, the ed, the editorial team, uh, because it seems to me that. Uh, well, it's true that the National and Sunday National have a place, an important place. There's a big place for people who are interested in independence and don't want to be infantilized. They, they, they actually desperately want to uh, contribute, uh, maybe in a slightly weighty way, to some of the things that are being discussed. And it seems to me that's terribly, terribly important uh, because uh, it's not helpful to a state uh, if if the debate is conducted on a fairly low tabloid level, because all that does is make people feel that the state they're in uh, is not serious. And, and that's not a good thing. We should, oh, I mean, uh, one of the most dispiriting things I ever came across was what, when years ago I went to a meeting in which the Labour MP at that time uh, was making, making a speech. And at the end of it, I said to him, well, what do you see as your role in this constituency? And this is what he said to me, and I kid you not, stay with me forever. He says, my job is to lower expectations. <laughs> now, to me, that was the saddest thing I'd ever heard <laughs> from, from a grown-up <laughs> who wasn't talking to kids. Uh, but it struck me that that's actually what the guy was actually meaning. He, he, he did seriously want to lower expectations because he felt that made his job easier. And I think that's very sad. I think all of us should be involved in raising expectations, not in, not in lowering them. And we have a responsibility in that regard, all of us. So let me end again by uh, thanking Stuart and recommending to all of you to read Elliot Bulmer's column in the Sunday National, uh, the Seven Day Supplement uh, this week. Uh, and also to conclude that uh, I hope you haven't missed any of uh, uh, Boris Johnson's comments justifying <laughs> the lies that he told of, over the parties. It seems to me that what he seemed to be saying in large part was it was essential. I hope I'm not paraphrasing them too inaccurately here. It was essential to the parties because that was uh, made for good government by people who were working long hours. Well, there must be a whole bunch of nurses who must be thinking to themselves, well, you know, I work lots of long hours, but nobody's ever suggested to me I should get pissed. Uh, and it seems to me if, it, if it's not good enough for the nurses, it certainly ain't good enough for the guys who are supposed to be governing. But then again, others will say to me, hey, come on, John, have you looked at the quality of the governance we're getting? <laughs> and maybe, maybe there's more drinking than we thought. <laughs> but uh, and I'm, I'm not just thinking about HS2, I'm thinking about uh, the, the tanks that, that don't run. And the, uh, and the aircraft carriers that, that don't work. Uh, uh, and we're talking about uh, millions and millions of pounds here. So again, thanks very much, uh, Stuart. Uh, Kevin, if you're there, uh, if you want to run the closing titles, uh, then uh, we wish everyone a very good night. Oh, and by the way, if I've mentioned it already, please support the crowdfunder, because Kevin and his team do a great job and uh, they're pretty much running on a shoestring. And so anything you can do to help uh, will be appreciated. Uh, thank you again. A, a good night, everyone. Stay safe, look after each other, and take care.